Good morning, everyone. First of all, I would like to welcome all our distinguished speakers and all the participants. We are joining us today for this special webinar on Nepal-China relations. I'm Shrusti Kafli, a journalist closely observing Nepal-China relations since a couple of years. Today's webinar is being held under the two-day event, Understanding Nepal's Foreign Policy, organized by Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement, NICE. I'd like to extend my sincere thanks to our distinguished speakers for allocating your precious time for this online event. The bios of our speakers have already been shared with the audience, so I would like to skip that part. Today we have Leela Manipodil, former Chief Secretary and former Nepali Ambassador to China. Similarly, we have Adron Prashad Lamichani, research scholar at Institute of Foreign Affairs. Similarly, we have Sanjay Upadhyay, author, and we have Siva Prashad Tiwari, faculty at National College. Likewise, we have Shravana Barua from Jawaharlal Nehru University, who is also the visiting fellow at NICE. So while we talk about Nepal-China relations, the bilateral ties have elevated to a strategic partnership since the visit of the Chinese President Xi Jinping to Nepal in October 2019. Since then, now the relation has been regarded as reached to a new height. Since then, how this relation has between the two neighbors progressed and what is the fate of BRI in Nepal and its implementation? How about the Nepal-China Railway Project? Today, we would like to explore these various aspects. So without delay, I would like to request the former Nepali ambassador to China and also the former chief secretary, Leela Manipaudil, for his special presentation. Sir, it's up to you now. Um, thank you, uh, Srishti. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Nish and uh, uh, Professor uh, Pramod uh, Jashwal for organizing this event and inviting me to speak in this uh, program. Um, uh, so let me, uh, so while talking about uh, Nepal China relations, let me briefly talk about what is China today. Um, China is, uh, as we know, that the world's second largest economy with the largest population. is the greatest, largest generator of outbound tourists today and uh, the largest holder of foreign currency reserve. Uh, it's the largest manufacturing hubs in the world and the largest exporter of goods uh, and commodities in the global market. And the recent pandemic uh, uh, has revealed that uh, China's uh, governance is the most effective in terms of controlling emer emergencies uh, like uh, the pandemic. Uh, Um, and China is uh, 48 times larger by population than Nepal, and its economy is about uh, 470 times of Nepalese economy. Um, the fundamentals of Nepal-China relations uh, dates back to millennia, and the, it's uh, in all dimensions, cultural, political, and economic and they are deep rooted and consistent and steadily maintaining a healthy momentum of uh, their bilateral relations. Um, they are, the relationship between the countries are guided by five principle of peaceful coexistence, charter of United Nations and principle of good neighborliness. They respect each other's core concerns and uh, interest. Basically, while talking about the core concerns and interest, interest uh, there is a core concern and interest of Nepal uh, towards China. That is unflinching commitment of one China policy that Nepal's, uh, uh, Nepal adheres with the uh, China's, uh, follows the China's core interest. And the Taiwan, Hong Kong, um, um, Tibet and Xinjiang related matters that uh, normally globally uh, surface out uh, and the, those issues uh, we are together with China. And the, we uh, consider that uh, Tibet, uh, Hong Kong and Xinjiang issues are China's internal matters. 
um, and Hong Kong and Taiwan are inalienable part of China. And then we are committed not allowing anti-Chinese activities on our soil. These are the China's core interest and Nepal consistently pursuing uh, the policy of, of uh, those uh, uh, adhering with the China's core interest and sensitivities. There are certain core interests of Nepal and that we expect uh, the China support also. One of the core interests of Nepal is the relentless support uh, on Nepal's upholding on country's independence and the sovereignty and territorial integrity. Um, the China has been consistently supporting uh, Nepal's on Nepal on our, its independence, sovereign equality, and territorial integrity. Whether we talk about the uh, 16th or 17th century, or 18th century, or uh, early 19th century, or after the establishment of diplomatic relations until um, mid um, 20th century until today. Um, China has uh, another interest of the China is uh, uh, gradually developing its economy and uh, substantially improved uh, living conditions of Chinese people, and also uh, is capable of of extending its development cooperation. And Nepal uh, interest is uh, getting more support from China on on, on development uh, uh, cooperation. Uh, that uh, we want that without having a policy interventions or intrusion on internal matters a continued and consistent uh, uh, support on our development endeavor. Um, historically, we can say that uh, there were some kinds of relationship, particularly cultural until the sixth century. And then uh, at the uh, beginning of seventh century, we had a more political relationship with China, particularly with the Tibet. But that uh, consistently um, China remain in the backyard with, the, with that uh, relationship with our Tibet. And the, uh, from 6th century to 14th century, we have the uh, more intensive cultural and political cooperations. From 16th century onwards, and then we've seen more uh, economic uh, and the uh, cultural and political all types of relationships. The first treaty was signed in 60, 1650, and that was more on economic aspect and political aspect. Uh, um, and the, the another uh, period that we can say that uh, the um, the relationship uh, from 1950s to, to 2008, the Nepal was under the early in the absolute monarchy and the later on the constitutional monarchy and the relationship with China uh, during that period remained consistent, although Nepal has witnessed uh, several political regime changes. After 2008, in a political uh, Republican setup too, the, our relationship have been continuously uh, uh, developing in a healthy manner. Uh, the recent relations that we can see that uh, have intensive collaborations and cooperations during that uh, pandemic uh, vulnerabilities, Nepal uh, uh, and the globally we exposed with the, with the uh, pandemic of COVID-19 uh, uh, related uh, um, health problems and the, uh, there were some emergency response mechanisms, the weaknesses of emergency response mechanisms globally and the domestically we witnessed those kinds of things and then we also witnessed that how the developed world uh, cooperate and react with the developing world on, on such uh, such emergencies that uh, uh, emerged as, as a new new uh, kinds of the uh, global order and the for development cooperations and new kinds of the aspirations and expectations and the uh, delivery and particularly that kinds of situations that we witnessed. Um, uh, talking about particularly pandemic, uh, China remains the largest supporter, supporters of COVID-19 vaccine, whether in terms of uh, grant assistance or, or the or market access for purchasing, procuring the COVID-19 uh, vaccines, and also the largest supplier of other uh, uh, COVID-related uh, uh, supplies, um, including medical supplies and the, and the uh, cooperation on sharing experiences and the uh, other kinds of the support, uh, general support from government as well as from people. Um, Nepal-China relation is a treaty based uh, because as I said that first treaty was signed in 1650. Um, then after, and then we have a successive treaties and the uh, latest one, we shouldn't say that treaty, but has substantially guided our relationship uh, by the Belt and Road initiatives that we have signed in, in, in uh, uh, 
2017. Um, our relations, as I said, that founded on the principle of non-alignment and peaceful coexistence, non-aggression and non neutral and neutral matters. Um, as I earlier said that China has unflinching support on Nepal and sovereign independence and territorial integrity and development and peace as, as definitely a praiseworthy and, and a role model for the relationship between two countries to us of having different sides and um, Our relationships are aimed at achieving goals such as mutual benefits, regional stability and common development. And there is a greater prospect of enhancing cooperation uh, for the revival of the ailing economy in the post pandemic era. Um, uh, in terms of uh, the, the um, um, economic cooperation, particularly the tourism, uh, China is the second largest uh, tourism uh, source country for Nepal and the rapidly growing uh, just before the pandemic. And then we are expecting uh, uh, influx of uh, Chinese tourists after the uh, uh, pandemic is over and the movements of people uh, becomes um, easier. Um, and the by investment in terms of investment, um, China is the largest uh, source for the uh, for the foreign direct investment in the recent recent successive years. Um, in terms of the connectivity, um, China has the largest network of, of railway and the logistic industry is most efficient and advanced and modern. And uh, that will definitely uh, help Nepal um, connect uh, with the outside world, not only with China, uh, with, with the Southeast Asia, South Asia, Northeast Asia and Middle East and also the uh, uh, Central Asia. What Nepal can expect are that uh, Nepal can expect a continued support from China on our territorial integrity, sovereign independence, peace and stability in the country. China is the country that uh, when there was a political movement uh, uh, um, in the name of their uh, very um, uh, respected leader Mao Zedong, but they never um, supported that political movement, although it was in the name of Mao Zedong. Um, that's why the China has policy of not intruding on internal matters and never supported the uh, anti-government uh, and the outlawed uh, forces in the past. And then we continually expect the China such kinds of the uh, uh, generous support uh, to the incumbent government and the respect the um, uh, selection of Nepalese people, choices of Nepalese people of the political system, social system, and the economic system as well and the help Nepal maintain peace, stability, and growth. And we also uh, continuously expect uh, the more development cooperations, particularly the, in, in terms of physical connectivities like railways, information highways, airways, pipelines, and the cross-border energy cooperation and tourism cooperation. And they also expected to enhance our production capa productive capacity of our Nepalese economy to make it more competitive in the global market. Um, China expects from Nepal, China's expectations from Nepal are continued support on China's one China okay. policy on Tibet, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Xinjiang and human rights related issues. And also China expects um, uh, that Nepal can maintain a social stability, political neutrality, maintain independence in decision making and controls anti-China activities in Nepalese soil. That is that are the China's expectations from Nepal. The challenge is particularly on these maintaining these kinds of the expectations is the sometimes that there are a lot of undue and external uh, pressures and, uh, um, on the China's uh, role for Nepal's development and divorce. And the sometimes that the um, some, some kinds of the external force uh, pressure uh, for maintaining the one China policy and the non-intrusion on China's internal matters and controlling on anti-Chinese anti -Chinese activities in the Pali Um um, what Nepal's need to do at present is that uh, if we see the, the uh, development cooperations, particularly in terms of tourism, in terms of investment, in terms of uh, other kinds of the uh, development assistance, um, Nepal, um, all the SAR countries except Bhutan have taken more advantage than Nepal from China's development. 
uh, even India is getting more uh, um, uh, the, the uh, kinds of the having a more uh, uh, advanced level of trade and and uh, and and investment cooperation. The AIIB, the China led uh, the multilateral um, agency, which was established under the theme of the BRI. Uh, the India is the largest beneficiary of uh, getting uh, investment from that, but Nepal has not been able to do that. Uh, that Nepal lacks a proper approach and consistency, ability to take decision on time and persuasion of the certain uh, major projects uh, continuously. And there is a political trust deficit as well. Sometimes that we um, uh, lose that political trust that's why we will not be able to get, we are not been able to get the proper benefit from that. Um, what we need to do is that we need to prepare, a, 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 first of all, we have to build a political trust for that the major political parties should have a, a consensus on what actually we expect from them, how we are going to receive the support, how we maintain our sovereign independence and, and the, uh, also uh, maintain a, a good momentum of relationship and the derived benefits from, from the, from the uh, development of China. And the, for that, we may require to prepare a, a roster of uh, priority projects and, and the, um, we have to ensure the predictable policy regime and consistency and modality of fundings and project execution. Um, we also have to um, constitute a strong team of high level officials responsible for developing projects and negotiating projects for funding. We also have to constitute a high level mechanism for the speedy implementation of the, of the uh, projects that uh, uh, mechanism must be endowed with full power to resolve the outstanding issues or the related issues that crop up during the time of implementation of the projects. And then such kinds of mechanism, all kinds of mechanisms should maintain the transparency and accountability. Um, uh, uh, in summary, what I can say that uh, socio-political stability and uh, uh, prosperity in Nepal and China is in the mutual interest of both the countries. And the, we have to build political trust and, the, um, um, and the promote the win-win cooperation um, that can help Nepal to be a vibrant bridge, not as a yam between two big boulders. Uh, China's logistic infrastructure and industry and the capability is uh, very high and the in logistic industry is very efficient and up-to-date and most competitive in the world. The China's transport network uh, is uh, very wide and then uh, Thousands of uh, uh, tons of cargoes are there transported from um, through railways from China to the Europe, and then we can use these all facilities. But the one condition is that we also should have the uh, a seamless transport connectivity with China, particularly the railway connectivity that enables us Nepal to connect with North, uh, East, and uh, uh, and the and the Central Asia and also Middle East and Europe. There is immense potential to promote tourism, investment, and development cooperation um, by enhancing the trans himalayan connectivity network uh, that we have already been agreed in the, in the 2017 during the um, signing MOU and also the agreed in several occasions when our president visited Beijing and, uh, and the um, uh, Chinese president visited Nepal in several occasions. We have made a commitment, we've signed an agreement but uh, the, in terms of the implementation of those agreements, we are uh, lagging behind. Uh, the way forward, uh, intensify the implementation of uh, MOUs and cooperation under DRI, and uh, take initiatives to enhance connectivity and uh, socioeconomic development, speed up construction of cross-border railway and develop uh, Nepal from landlocked countries to landlocked country. Um, activate all bilateral consultative mechanisms, including joint commissions and working groups to promote relationship in culture, trade, investment, power, energy, and economy, and implement all agreements and MOEs, understandings, and understanding reached in the recent past, particularly from 2016 to 2019. These periods are um, more uh, vitally important in terms of, of agreeing on several agreements and uh, 
um, cooperations. Um, and we also need to strengthen our cooperations um, in the United Nations and the regional organizations to safeguard the common interest of developing countries, uh, collaborate on regional, regional issues and support each other on the matters of in, in the mutual interest for maintaining regional peace and stability. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Paudel, for shedding light on various aspects of Nepal-China relations, including prospects, challenges, and also the way out. Uh, definitely, there is a greater prospect for collaboration, particularly for economic cooperation and for more development uh, cooperation. But as you mentioned, uh, Nepal lacks proper approach and there is a political trust deficit. So hopefully, the two countries will work together for this. Uh, thank you so much once again for your special presentation. Now, uh, moving forward, I would like to request uh, Mr. Sanjay Upadhyay, Nepali author, for his special presentation. Thank you, Sistiji, oh. and thank oh, you. Uh, there is a there is a hacking on the on that side, no? Have you noticed? On the live one? Yes, there is a there is a very uh, uh, yeah, filthy, I hope filthy, our filthy, technique... filthy, filthy pictures that successively uh, appear in the, in the James Martin. There is a James Martin something. I don't know who is this. Uh, you hope you our have not seen only on, on, that? only only in my in my screen. I don't know. Yes, there is a very disturbing video, which is uh, very difficult yes. to watch. Please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a very filthy, filthy. I uh, hope our uh, technical team uh, at NICE uh, will handle that. Uh, sorry, uh, we could not get you. What happened? There is uh, one um, uh, that uh, participants, um, James Martin. Okay, and, uh, we'll remove him immediately, sir. Filthy, the filthy video. Filthy video is, uh, is uh, here. Very difficult to watch even. Very, very. Uh, um... Okay, hope uh, the technical team will handle that. Uh, we are extremely sorry for that. Uh, let's move forward. So I'd like to request Mr. Sanjay Padre for his uh, presentation. Yes, thank you, Sir CG, and thank you, Nice and. Uh... Dr. Pramod Jaiswal for inviting me. It's a great pleasure and honor to be able to express my views here. I uh, have not come here with any specific subject matter. Uh, what I would like to pick up on is, as, as a longtime observer of Nepal-China uh, relations within the context of recent global developments, I would like to speak more to the political uh, trust deficit that we've been uh, uh, Ambas Ambassador so eloquently uh, presented. We have the underpinnings uh, for uh, Nepal-China relations in terms of agreements, uh, commitments, and uh, joint commissions, working groups. We have all those uh, in place. But uh, there are periods, especially after 2008, where um, the robustness of our Nepali political system has somehow uh, given a sense of dissonance on phases of Nepal-China relationships where things happen within particular governments. They do not happen uh, when that government falls. Uh, and um, our own um, media coverage of the Nepali side is very, very robust, very, very open to the point where uh, sometimes we even uh, do not know what the real issues uh, that we are uh, uh, facing in that relationship in the particular time. And on the other hand, the Chinese being traditionally circumspect, uh, we do not know from their uh, side either uh, through um, any, uh, appreciable uh, public forum about uh, Nepal, uh, the expectations of Nepal and what 
you know, the, going forward, how uh, Beijing would uh, like to see Nepal uh, uh, see Nepal uh, pursue its relationship with China. Now, from what I gather, I mean, um, Ambassador Borel uh, has, has firsthand experience, other speakers also, you know, with more connection. I'm removed far away, sitting here, um, observing Nepal-China relations from a broad uh, historical and contemporary uh, basis. What I feel is we have this fund of goodwill, you know, especially uh, Nepal and China, uh, China and Nepal. You know, I, I, I generally like to joke um, here in the US while explaining uh, the Nepalese mindset, you know, we love uh, democracy. We have one of the most robust democracies. Uh, we love it, but you know, when it comes to Tibet, I mean, we're a little, you know, we're more geopoliticians than uh, all of us Nepalis. Uh, so, um, you know, we know that China as a Northern neighbor has been a strong upholder of Nepal's independence, sovereignty, territorial integrity. Uh, Nepal too, as far as I can understand is, it's not the concern about whether Nepal's commitment or lack of is an issue here. It's how third party pressures that whether Nepal can withstand those while upholding its stated and long-standing commitments to its one China policy. Uh, Tibet, of course, obviously comes to mind. And um, the Chinese uh, grievances there, you can easily gauge them from speaking to academics, you know, in a non-bilateral setting. You know, they're very uh, articulate and very open about that. But um, at the same time, the Nepali concern also, I mean, uh, it gets drowned out, you know, in the more uh, vivacious uh, streets and uh, the media commentary on Nepal-China relationship. Uh, throughout history, I mean, uh, what, what, what Nepal's grievances were. I'm talking about political trust, you know, political grievances. Let's say whether in 1816, 1814, 1816 Anglo uh, uh, Nepalese War, whether uh, we talk about uh, 1989, 90, whether we talk about 2005, 2006. Um, and uh, from the Chinese side, the same uh, issues come up over what our how how um, what what worth our our commitments are, if we just cannot be uh, keeping those, and I think uh, this trust deficit is something that we have to uh, become very very mindful of in the near term, as I observe, when we are approaching the. Dalai Lama succession in Tibet, you know, that, that's, that's one turning point that uh, we really have to uh, be able to focus on from our side, if not entirely our side, our ability to, uh, you know, make independent and sovereign decisions on our commitments to the entire Nepal-China relationship. And whatever we're seeing from the Chinese side, you know, I, hesitate to read too much into it, but I mean, symbolism being what it is in Chinese diplomacy, um, the absence of, at the, at the UML uh, conference, uh, certain commentaries, certain things that we have seen in outright uh, expression of Nepal's place in, you know, China's new uh, border security plus the new uh, Chinese uh, administrative structure, central administrative structure on national security. Uh, these issues become uh, very crucial as we go on towards that, that period because the, the, the Dalai Lama succession, you know, it's, it's not like, you know, uh, the king is dead, long live the king, like, you know, one comes and the other goes. We have that a period that's gonna be fairly uh, contentious, you know. First of all, if we go by tradition, uh, Tibetan tradition, we have to have a, a, any period from three to five years will be very, very crucial for us as 
you know, both sides have their competing uh, uh, preparations going on. And we don't know what the incumbent Dalai Lama is going to do about that. And it is that, at that point where, you know, an extended phase of instability in Nepal, uh, where uh, mountains are not, uh, you know, the, the traditional bulwarks they used to be, you know, with technology. And Nepal being uh, uh, a very uh, uh, soft in terms of its ability in, in uh, governance, in uh, political, uh, ability to independently chart its uh, ch relationships with China, its ability to obligate or you know uh, tackle third party, fourth party, fifth party uh, uh, pressures on that crucial issue. And then um, once th that's that that's one phase that we are um, very concerned about China. Well, I, I don't speak for the China or the Chinese government. I'm just, uh, as, an, as a Nepali observer, making the point of how that, that is likely to you know, come into the fore as we approach that period. But at the same time, again, now, what, what strikes me um, as very, very uh, something that has not had a too much discussion in the past or even in the present now is how uh, you know China sees Nepal as part of its continuous civilizational approach to the outside world. Now I, I say this because uh, we entered a tributary relationship with China without probably even knowing what it was, and even to this day, nobody can. Uh, easily define what the Chinese tributary system uh, was or what its modern manifestations are likely to be in, in the region. But again, one thing we have to see is we, the, 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 from, from Imperial China to Republican China to uh, Communist China, there was a time where the Chinese would assert very uh, uh, effectively and very, uh, Honorously, that N Nepal was something that they lost to uh, Western imperialism uh, uh, during the century of humiliation. Now, the world has moved past, uh, you know, that phase of you know, revengeism. You know, I don't think uh, you know we can go back to that kind of uh, thinking. But I am not sure. I know that 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 kind of uh, thinking or that kind of feeling or sentiment has ever been uh, revoked or you know officially but if it's a mindset uh, that guides us then what difference would that may be from uh, the pressures emanating from our southern uh, uh, southern uh, neighbor which again puts us in the place of a contested sovereignty. Uh, so do we, uh, do we, and, and what I'm seeing from the Chinese press is some, some indication of, uh, uh, you know, that kind of thinking saying that, okay, well, Nepal, um, you know, seeks China's support only when it feels threatened by India. And once, you know, they get uh, uh, things uh, patch up with India, then they, you know, just hold back on uh, uh, their commitments to the future. And, uh, you know, and those, those things tend to be born out of facts. Ambassador mentioned that Nepal uh, uh, is the last in the region apart from Bhutan to take advantage of this immense uh, potential uh, with China. Even India is doing that better, uh, you know, under the not, uh, BRA, AIB. Uh, framework um, is it because our concern, or is it because you know if we have ways of dragging our foot, do the Chinese have the same way of uh, dragging their uh, foot? Is it is it some sort of displeasure that's uh, you know uh, being not necessarily to Nepal, but I mean to country to Nepal's inability to uh, uh, the question obviously becomes then why why was prior to two thousand eight. 
uh, we had an institution where uh, the Chinese could uh, uh, repose their trust and uh, faith in uh, if uh, we uh, set up that head of state institution, uh, the presidency in place of the monarchy, then why hasn't Rastapati Bhavan or you know, the president's office been uh, transformed into that kind of role? Uh, these things, uh, I think, uh, from the Nepali side and the Ch Chinese side, these we, they cannot be uh, swept up uh, under the carpet because this is going to really influence our uh, ability. I mean, uh, e even the nature of our uh, dialogue sometimes, you know, it makes me wonder. Uh, we talk about these, uh, <clears throat> it's very easy to fall into this trap. Oh, uh, the new ports and the new uh, infrastructures and but the cost, I mean, uh, China can never uh, replace India and Nepal. That's the automatic, you know, second line, third line, and if you news story commentary. I mean, wh wh why is this talk about, you know, replacing India come about? Oh, it, it's maybe, you know, in the long history of uh, uh, Nepal-China relations, there were periods where China withdrew, where China could be more assertive economically, uh, politically, commercially. It, Maybe this is one of those phases. Maybe our old relationship can be, uh, you know, brought back. Uh, we why do we think of you know 150, 250, 350 years? Maybe we can, we need to go back to uh, our, our our own past to see you know uh, what what kind of relationship is possible when when one country rises when two simultaneously rise, and um, so so these things I think are not being debated and are not. Uh, being uh, as an observer, as a student, that I would like to see answers to. I mean, I understand uh, uh, we have uh, specialists, uh, speakers, we have uh, very um, distinguished people, and I am here just an observer, a st longtime student. Uh, but I think the these are questions that Nepal China needs to. Uh, we both countries, these are just two examples. The Dalai Lama said, Uh, all the underpinnings of the civil and strong relationship that we have with China, that we that Nepal can be uh, able to take uh, benefit from, and I would appreciate. I would be interested to hear uh, uh, my co-panelists on this issue, if possible. If it's, it's not, not, it does not uh, drag away from their uh, original uh, subject matter and uh, subject. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Pade, for your observation and for your concerns. And definitely you also mentioned about trust deficit, which is one of the most important factors in the Nepal-China relations. So hope the two countries will be able to uh, work on that and hope they will be more mindful. Uh, thank you so much once again for your observation. Uh, sorry for the inconvenience caused by some spammers. Uh, I hope it's fine now. Uh, let's move forward. Now I would like to request uh, Mr. Siva Prashad Tiwari, faculty at National College for his uh, presentation. Um, I have prepared some slides. Uh, let me try if I can share it. Sure. So uh, uh, can you see the slides? Yes. yes. Yes, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> so, uh, um, I uh, thank you very much for uh, permitting me, allowing me to uh, make a presentation on Nepal-China relations uh, here. I benefited a lot from uh, listening to uh, Ambassador Leela Mani Podel, sir, and Sanjay Ubadhyay, sir. I am very, uh, I enjoy reading uh, Sanjay Ubadhyay, sir's uh, writings very much uh, and uh, i feel fortunate that uh, i have been um, been allowed to be a co-panelist here uh, today with uh, 
uh, such honored people. <clears throat> um, actually, uh, you know, uh, China's uh, position in the world has changed a lot, uh, as Ambassador uh, Powell he clearly uh, highlighted. Uh, for example, in 1980s, uh, its GDP was uh, seventh largest in the world, and now it is uh, second largest in terms of uh, purchasing power parity. Uh, economy on the basis of purchasing power parity basis, it has been the largest country in the world. Um, Ambassador Powell has already highlighted it. It is the largest manufacturing hub in the world. And uh, uh, in many other respects, uh, even if you take an indicator of uh, you know, number of outbound tourists, this, this is this statistics is uh, before COVID pandemic began. Uh, the largest number comes from China. And uh, um, you know, with uh, this, uh, uh, with policy of economic reform brought about by China's paramount leader Deng Xiaoping, uh, China has achieved uh, almost uh, uh, impossible things. You know, uh, its, uh, uh, its uh, economic growth has remained about more than nine percent for successive for about four decades, uh, and uh, now it has uh, gone down slightly, um, but. Uh, um, and its GDP doubled uh, every eight years. And uh, even if you see its power in terms of uh, scientific developments, if you were to see you know, Mars missions, uh, it, it is almost at par with uh, United States of America. And it has not hesitated to, uh, with the coming of Xi Jinping, um, it has not, uh, it has changed its uh, approach to to. Uh, deal with international uh, deal in international politics. So whereas uh, the wisdom of then Xiaoping used to be uh, maintain the low profile, get the things done, hide your strength and bide your time, or feel the stones and cross the river. Uh, the uh, with uh, uh, Xi Jinping or uh, uh, his predecessors uh, Hu Jintao, uh, China has. Uh, uh, Increasingly, being started to be overt in its uh, active, uh, you know, it's in its action, in power projection, uh, in international politics. Uh, this is what I uh, believe. And uh, uh, with this, uh, there, has, you know, China's rise economically and hence uh, militarily. So, with economic rise or with economic might, most of the countries in the world, it's, uh, if you even if we study international relations theory. Um, it's not necessary to have idea of international relation theories uh, as such to understand that with uh, uh, you know with economic might uh, countries become more assertive and uh, China is not exception in that regard. And with China's rise, uh, you know one um, one uh, very uh, interesting phenomenon in world politics has been that uh, you know um, 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 uh, there has been. Um, you know, people have started raising eyebrows because China is not a power something like uh, Western uh, uh, countries like United States of America or Western countries from Western Europe. Uh, so um, these countries uh, are said to be creating and sustaining liberal uh, order that has been, uh, you know, consolidated after 1990s. And uh, uh, with respect to this, Uh, sorry, let me try to move my slides. Okay. And in this context, uh, it is important for us to uh, understand uh, the opportunities that we get from China's rise. And uh, uh, it is also equally necessary to talk about challenges that we may face because of China's rise. If we say that you know China's rise uh, only will have positive impact on our uh, development. Uh, so. Um, um, I think that will not be a fair uh, assessment from our side. So, um, you know, this China's rise has triggered a kind of uh, in-depth study about China throughout the world. Um, it's, it's uh, you know, a lot of people are studying about China now. May it be think tank or universities or intelligence agencies or media. So I think uh, it's high time that we also start studying uh, about China in detail and have fragmented and robust 
China policy of our own, from our own perspective, uh, because the pers neither the perspective of the West, which tries to demonize China or paint China as evil, or you know, perspective of some countries which paint everything good about China uh, will be uh, will, will be suitable for us. So uh, let me just say, China is a great power now, and is, it is in the process of becoming superpower. Some uh, political analysts or scholars have said that China, China has not uh, showed its real strength, both in terms of economy and military power. Uh, it's, it might have hidden. And it, it is in the process of becoming superpower, which it will do uh, within uh, a matter of decades. You know, the, the rise of China has been uh, very much, uh, very much uh, spectacular. So it has been very much uh, dramatic, if you uh, say. And some scholars even have uh, said that China might be in the process of becoming a lone superpower because of continent size population, its geography, and and because of its, uh, oh, you know, wisdom of uh, um, fusing. Uh, uh, a, a, a fusing a liberal economy uh, in, inside uh, uh, with uh, a communist uh, authoritarian politics. So uh, China's experiment of political economy after coming up Deng Xiaoping to power has been, uh, you know, a matter of great study uh, or a surprise, uh, if you say, throughout the world. So uh, with uh, China's adoption of uh, liberal uh, market economy, a uh, market economy. And uh, the, the way, uh, you know, we, it used uh, so-called mainstream uh, economy uh, that was claimed by the West. Uh, they thought that China would gradually, uh, you know, go into a liberal democracy because uh, open market economy would, would, would create a kind of environment conducive for uh, political freedom or liberal democracy. Uh, and China would, uh, uh, would not be exception, they thought. But, uh, um, it has just been the opposite. So uh, China has, with the coming of Xi Jinping to the power, uh, China seems to be growing a bit more authoritarian. The uh, uh, control of the center has been um, going, growing uh, more and more. And uh, uh, so uh, uh, this, uh, this leader, Xi Jinping, has been the most powerful leader after uh, Mao, uh, um, Mao Zedong and Deng Xiaoping. And there has been there have been different theories uh, to explain China's rise. For example, uh, uh, China says that its rise is peaceful, and it has also promoted a theory called China Development Theory, which it uh, which says that you know uh, uh, in line with uh, Deng Xiaoping's thought of uh, you know a political system that should be able to deliver. Uh, uh, there is a popular statement by Deng Xiaoping: uh, whether the cat is black or white, it should be able to. Uh, you know, catch the rat or kill the rat. So uh, there have there there has been a lot of optimism uh, with uh, these uh, China promoted theories, China's development theory, and China's uh, in Nepal also. Uh, there have been um, people have started talking about you know uh, borrowing China's development model, uh, but we should not think that China's development model is free from China's develop political economy. You know, so uh, there has to be clarity on our part about uh, when we talk about China, importing China's development model. So we should be clear on uh, whether we are talking about uh, this development. Development is not free from political ideology that we subscribe to. So, and China's peaceful rise, I think we can agree on this. But the West that has worried because of, uh, you know, China's challenge to the world order has come up uh, uh, with its own uh, theories of China threat theory, because they say that you know, with if uh, our present day world order crumbles or collapses, is are threatened because of China's rise, uh, so um, you know the, the world might have more conflicts. And they have even started uh, propagating this theory, uh, China collapse theory, uh, which China Chinese obviously say is a wishful thinking of the uh, you know uh, Western powers. Um, China says. So I have already said that China has already been the largest economy in terms of purchasing power parity, largest FDI investor. Uh, and uh, before COVID-19 pandemic, Chinese made the largest number of 
uh, outbound tourists. And with uh, China's policy, uh, now uh, Sanjay Upadhyay sir said that China is, is a bit more circumspect, but I feel that with adoption of this uh, theory, which uh, China uh, going uh, by China, China has now adopted going global strategy. This uh, I think uh, is uh, said in uh, several ways. Uh, some some people say it go out policy or go global policy. Most probably this trans uh, different translations. Uh, of, um, these are different translations of a, a Chinese uh, concept. So China has uh, started encouraging both its uh, you know private enterprises and its uh, uh, state funded corporations to go to other countries and invest. And uh, um, with this, uh, what has happened is uh, with China's rise. Um, scholars have already said that you know the second cold war might be in the process of beginning if it has not already begun so some some people have said it, it has already begun and uh, nepal is you know my assumption is that um, nepal might be uh, a spot uh, where uh, you know uh, if this this uh, beginning of the second cold war has been felt if it has not been started from here so uh, in Nepal, it has um, China, uh, you know, it used to maintain uh, government to government uh, uh, relation, state to state relation until 2008, largely state to state relation until 2008 when monarchy was there. With monarchy, it had very good relation, though, the, um, you know, Chinese communism and monarchy were conceptually anachronistic, or conceptually incongruent. So um, China had very good relation with uh, monarchy. And uh, uh, during 1960, when uh, 60s, when China had to prove to the world that it it was respectful of the sovereignties of the country, big or small, and it was not threat to the world order. And when it needed, uh, you know, acceptance uh, from larger, uh, many more, more countries of the world, uh, it uh, started maintaining a good relations with countries like Nepal and Burma, Myanmar. Burma, which now is called Myanmar, and China maintained that type of uh, relation which respected Nepal's sovereignty until 2008. Uh, after monarchy was gone, China has reached to many um, actors um, in Nepal, political parties, NGOs, and our security establishments, and most probably many more intellectuals, journalists, and media sector as well. And, uh, you know, since we uh, do not have very critical studies uh, about uh, China's approach in Nepal. Uh, so uh, uh, it's very difficult. Uh, it, it's a bit difficult to find out, uh, you know, how China has been influencing uh, Nepal's political development. And um, added to this, uh, Nepal is the only country in the world where the number of communist voters or communist parties has consistently increased after this famous declaration of Francis Fukuyama as the uh, end of history in 1989. Uh, and uh, this is, Nepal is an exception in that, in this regard. So uh, though most of our communists might have become communists by reading literature in Hindi or Nepali, because of their political indoctrination or ideology, they, are, they have a kind of, uh, you know, attachment towards China. And uh, uh, due to lack of critical studies about this, uh, China and Nepal's communists have developed very close relations now, uh, including, uh, you know, joint symposiums and uh, study of Xi Jinping thought, and um, you know, uh, and a lot of literatures have been uh, produced in Nepali market, uh, and they have been spread, they have been propagated, and this I see is a real challenge to Nepal because Nepal has fought for democracy for about. 70 years and this close proximity with China and uh, 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 you know CCP's interest in uh, with uh, you know uh, CCP's interest and collaboration okay, but collaboration with uh, Nepal's communist parties has uh, you know um, created a kind of suspicion in uh, forces that have fought for democracy in Nepal. I think uh, both China and Nepal's communists have to be careful of this because we are in a very sensitive uh, geopolitical location, and uh, 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 Sanjay Upadhyay sir said that you know uh, we should uh, we should not uh, be believing on uh, uh, discourses that say that China is, could not be used as substitute for India, uh, right? But uh, actually, that this type of uh, you know thinking idea comes from Chinese leaders themselves. 
you know, until uh, Hu Jintao, uh, you know, Chinese leaders most probably conveyed these messages to Nepalese. They said, Nepali leaders, they said that, you know, Nepal should have good relations with India because we you cannot be substitute uh, for India. Uh, this is not uh, Nepal's original idea. Uh, if we believe in literatures um, that, um, that we read. So uh, uh, some people have felt that, some analysts have felt that uh, in Nepal, China's, uh, China's deeper strategic penetration might embolden anti-democratic communist forces in Nepal. And this will you know, increase our geopolitical, um, you know, the geopolitical um, uh, 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 imperative is there on us. And our geopolitical sensitivity, our ge geopolitical, um, you know, uh, risks will be increased because of China's increased strategic penetration in Nepal. Now China has, uh, you know, uh, uh, not shied away from, um, you know, uh, making deeper uh, strategic penetration in Nepal. Uh, my understanding is that uh, throughout the history, um, uh, rather than bigger powers that have, you know, uh, 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 that have come to Nepal and made strategic space for themselves. Um, our elites in Nepal have been, have larger responsibility for dragging them and dragging the dragon uh, to the ex beyond limit uh, could be very much dangerous. So one of my students I had written yesterday, uh, you know, most of our elites are people who read and write on our foreign policies. Um, they so, you know, they, 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 they try to portray more risk. They, try to create a fear of uh, an environment of fear. Uh, but I'm really afraid in my, uh, I'm really afraid that, you know, dragging, uh, you know, global powers beyond limit uh, can uh, have severe consequences. Um, the example of Afghanistan has shown that Nepal might not become next Afghanistan or it might not become next Cambodia, but uh, I, have been, I have been writing that Nepal can become altogether different examples of different example of a geopolitical battleground. So, um, you know, we have been saying that Nepal does not have foreign policy of its own. So to argue, to, to argue, to, to argue uh, for a robust and pragmatic China policy, um, or, you know, to, to argue for uh, in-depth studies about China from our own perspective, because we should not see China from perspective of Mongolia or uh, from perspective of uh, of Southeast Asian states or from perspective of India or from perspective of Pakistan, from our own history of interaction with China or China's behavior towards us, uh, uh, we should have a robust, pragmatic, theoretically informed, based on our necessity. And that, you know, that, 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 that protects our sovereignty and that benefits us. Uh, we should have uh, one such China policy. And uh, I think we need to. Uh, reset our China policy in that way, but I see that uh, we don't have uh, robust think tanks. Uh, our think tanks uh, have not been working in that direction. Um, uh, so this use of word called reset in policy has become almost like a cliche, but I could not find a better word than this. So with this, I would like to conclude my presentation. And thank you, uh, Nice and Dr. Pramod Jaiswal for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we had Sivya Prashad Tiwari, faculty at National College. Thank you so much for your observation and uh, for highlighting the need of a new China policy, which is which needs to be robust and pragmatic and also based on uh, Nepal's own perspectives. Uh, thank you so much for highlighting uh, the importance of this new policy. Uh, we have uh, now another speaker. Uh, Mr. Dron Prashad Lamichani, who is a research scholar at Institute of Foreign Affairs. Uh, may I request, sir, for your special presentation? Okay. Thank you, Srishti Kapli, Miss, and all of the presented, presentators and participant, participants. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Parmod, sir, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I want to express my opinion on the topic of uh, Silk Route enhancing Nepal-China connectivity and its geostrategic implications. The 
the bridge debate is top of the foreign policy agenda of Nepal. Now, since uh, since one decade, the buffer zone mentality is going to challenge by bridge debate. Thus, uh, being landed country between the China and India is not more cost for Nepal. Its special geographical location can be drawn into the vibrant bridge. There are some logical foundations behind it. The increasing volume of trade between India and China indicate same. India and China are, are doing trade competitions despite of a serious border dispute and other uh, political issues. However, their economic cooperation, their economic trade through the sea route is more difficult and costly. It took a long time. India and China doesn't have more al alternatives to do trade through the land route, except the Nathula Pass. Nathula Pass has quite difficult because it is high altitude and other border dispute. There's, there is possible roadway through the Nepal, which is from Northern Indian state, Bihar to uh, Kerung, which is just only 265 kilometers. It saves time and cost. Nepal and China did trade and transit agreement and boundary and road initiatives agreement, which can give great, great opportunity to open up this route. Through the trade and transit agreement, Nepal and China agreed to open up seven transit route, four sea port and three dry port. After the signing of Belt and Road Initiatives, Nepal has, has been participating in Belt and Road Conference. During the Nepal's Prime Minister visit in Beijing in 2018, and Nepali President Vidya Devi Bhandari visited in 2019. At that time, Nepal and China agreed to implement MOU project uh, under the BRI project to connect trans Himalayan connectivity. During the uh, Chinese president visit in Nepal in 2019, also Nepal and China agreed to implement MOU and to feasibility study under the Belt and Road Initiatives Trans Himalayan Connectivity. Nepal and China wanted to link through the railway network from Kerung to Kathmandu, Kathmandu to Pokhara and Lumbini. That can be convert Nepal as a buffer zone to bridge. It, it can convert Nepal's geo-strategic competition to geo-economic competitions. However, Nepal has been viewed by security perspective by India. India thought that India, India's security perception is that Himalayan and ocean region is in its security parameters. Nepal can act as a strategic Himalayan frontier. Any threat from China can protect by Nepal. We can see India's security perception arrives, arrives when Tibet became part of the China. After that, Nepal became buffer zone for China and India. 
India and Nepal signed the Peace and Friendship Treaty, and India and Nepal puts security check post in the Nepal Tibet border line. During the after during the Nepal China agreed to open up Godari Raj Marg. At that time, India shows is its security alertness, security concerns. If Nepal couldn't persist, resist any security challenges through this road, it can directly hunt the India's heartland. Because India thought that India thinks Nepal Tarai region is it's more important zone. If something happened in this area, it's a directly impact in India's heartland. Next thing is that India and China, China's border war 1962 and border disputes also makes trust defeats to do trans Himalayan connectivity. India has not joined BRI project, and India has strongly reservation on CPEC project. CPEC goes through the Pakistan occupied Kashmir, which is disputed area. Both India and Pakistan claim this is their own territory. So India said that through the CPEC, It's, it has violated India's territorial integrity and sovereignty. That is why India thinks that Belt and Road Initiatives is a string of poles. China want to influence where the China's, India's influencing area in South Asia and Nepal and Himalayan zone. On the other hand, in the Nepal, MCC program also seems quite geopolitical implications. Some leaders and political scientists say that it is the part of IPS, Indo-Pacific strategy. And some people and political parties say it's as aims to counter the BRI. Therefore, China's interest to link South Asia through Nepal and its strategic move, and India's and America's alliance in Nepal and South Asia makes quite complex geopolitical scenario. Thus, the trilateral Revelry in into the Nepal will hamper the Nepal's national interest. However, we can see after the geo, after the Cold War period, the regional integrations and economic integrations make reduce the political instability and trust defeat defeat in the security sector. We can see European Union, ASEAN, like that. On the other hand, we can see most of the small countries, some small country like Switzerland, has took lots of economic benefit from their neighbors. And Mongolia, like that, we can we can take same like that benefit through our neighbors because it is essence sensory. We are lying between signing India and rising China with biggest economy, market, advanced technology, industry, and infrastructure development. All of those things can be benefit for Nepal. But our leadership capacity can't achieve those advantages. We have to make K 
clear transit policy to grab this opportunity. We have to make, we have to secure our neighbors to address the security issue of our neighbors. We have to propose India also to make Nepal transit to reach India. So that I want to say here, to become a buffer to bridge geopolitical competitions to geo-strategic competition, geo-strategic geo competition to geo-economic competitions, we have to make trilateral security mechanism. Development and security mechanism should go together. Then only ne Nepal can be bridged between two neighbors. I want to conclude my presentation here. Thank you for giving me this presentation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Drun Prashad Lamichani, research scholar at the Institute of Foreign Affairs for highlighting various aspects, including uh, BRI, MCC, and so on. Uh, definitely your idea of uh, uh, transforming Nepal from buffer to breeze uh, is interesting and also the need of an hour. Uh, you also highlighted on a strategic Himalayan frontier. Uh, this is also quite interesting. Uh, so thank you so much once again uh, for your constructive suggestions. Uh, we had one more speaker, uh, but uh, she is not present due to her health reasons. So hopefully we can hear from her uh, next time in other sessions. Uh, we were streaming live. We are still streaming live in different platforms, including Zoom and Facebook, and also through Twitter. So we had received a few questions from the audience. So I would like to uh, share those questions here. Uh, the first question would be for the for former Ambassador Powell. Uh, we received the questions in both Facebook and Twitter. Uh, what can China do to further enhance ties in Nepal in post-COVID era where the West is trying to isolate China? Uh, similarly, we have second question uh, that is also for the Ambassador Powell. Uh, what can Nepal learn from China with regards to ramping up manufacturing capabilities? We received this question in Twitter. So I'd like to request Ambassador Powell uh, to respond to these questions. Okay, um, thank you, Srishti. Um, uh, first question was about uh, that. Uh, uh, what can, uh, yeah, I, 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 I enhance so, cooperation in post current pandemic era when the uh, West is trying to isolate China? Uh, we have to uh, look China from our own eyes, not from uh, Western countries' eyes. They have their own interest with China. They have their own uh, um, uh, own uh, kinds of relationship, level of relationship, and uh, uh, rivalry, and corporations, and uh, and they are um, they have a um, capability to to sometime that uh, um, influence each others or they obstruct each others or sometime that uh, um, try to rally their cooperations with the, with the, with the, with other countries. Um, uh, um, but we uh, have to look from our own eyes and then we definitely can enhance our cooperation with China in the post-pandemic era. As I mentioned in my presentation as well, during that pandemic period, China remained the largest supplier of vaccine and other medical supplies. That's why in both the cases, um, uh, it in terms of uh, their generosity to support uh, Nepalese people, and in terms of providing access to the market, because that uh, in post uh, during the pandemic period, many countries uh, not only close the border, they close uh, their access to the to the uh, medical supply, and the including vaccines uh, in their market, uh, approaching to their market, but uh, China remained. Uh, uh, more generous uh, in terms of, of uh, supporting Nepal. Um, uh, in the post-pandemic era, uh, particularly, we uh, there will be a big influx of Chinese tourists. Uh, uh, as China is the largest outbound tourism source uh, in the world, 
uh, more than uh, 16 million Chinese uh, travel uh, abroad in 2017. Um, that's why it's the, um, it's the largest source and the Nepal can immensely benefit from the uh, China's Chinese people's uh, um, tendency to going out for a retreat, uh, for the pleasure trip, for the vacations, um, and the somehow also the visiting different uh, religious sites, including uh, Tibet, uh, in, including uh, Lumbini. Um, Nepal need to prepare uh, tune its uh, tourism market um, um, to to um, attract more Chinese tourists in terms of uh, enhancing connectivity and, and road connectivity and the road, uh, um, uh, air connectivity um, in terms of, of developing facilities like the Chinese foods, restaurant, tour guides speaking Chinese and the developing packages that Chinese people are more, uh, uh, more uh, fond of, particularly they are they, they um, prefer the uh, pleasure trips, they prefer the natural beauty, they prefer enjoyment, they prefer a lot of uh, eateries, fooding, you know, they, um, they eat uh, varieties of foods. That's why we, if we prepare that kind of the uh, tourism uh, uh, infrastructure and tourism market, and then we definitely would be able to invite more Chinese tourists and then we have to promote in China. Also in terms of investment too, um, there is a uh, slack in investment and global investment. And that there will be more competition in uh, getting a foreign direct investment post pandemic era. Uh, on that situation, and then we have to access some Chinese uh, investors. So we have to approach Chinese investors and invite them, provide a more uh, level playing field for, uh, for uh, um, uh, exploring and uh, exploiting the opportunities uh, that we have to enhance our uh, production capacity and also the um, um, creating job employment opportunities and also expanding our, our uh, export uh, capabilities, uh, enhancing our uh, export basket as well. Um, that question also related with another uh, um, Another another in, uh, request about the knowing about the manufacturing uh, ramping up manufacturing, um, uh, uh, taking support from China. Uh, so the question uh, I don't know that who has raised this question, but um, the manufacturing is not only a a, 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 um, a factor of of uh, uh, the labor labor cost. Uh, only being labor cost cheaper is not sufficient enough uh, to establish a manufacturing industry. First, uh, we need to have the world class logistic industry and the most competitive and the most reliable and predictable logistic industry. These days, the manufacturing takes place in different places and then assembled in one place. Like the, uh, the, the uh, mobile phone, let's say that uh, the Apple phone that assembled in China the parts are manufactured in different countries in different uh, parts of the world, more than 20 countries. And they arrive in China at the assembly point just on the on time. Not come earlier, because if they invite, they, they, they dump the large number of, uh, large quantity of that uh, um, assembly units, particular units, and they have to spend much more money on, on warehouse and uh, handling that uh, cargo. If they don't come on exact time, uh, could not receive exact on time and then production will be disturbed. That's why they receive just on time. For that, you have to maintain a precise time, the timely delivery of those products and the needs of uh, quality human resource as well. Not only cheap labor, we need a quality human resource for uh, manufacturing uh, and goods. Um, third one, third required is that uh, basically, uh, if we uh, even that uh, invite uh, Chinese investors, and then uh, we have to provide a conducive ground for producing a common goods competitive uh, market for can compete in the market. 
um, for that uh, requires the land, requires the legal provisions, requires the procedures and the um, labor unrest is also one of the reasons that uh, manufacturers are very reluctant to uh, come to Nepal. We have to resolve those issues for uh, ramping up manufacturing in Nepal, uh, taking assistance from China. Thank you. Uh, th thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Powdell. Uh, we have one more question uh, uh, in our platform, so maybe you can answer this as well. The question is, uh, in recent times, the intense engagement of China in Nepalese politics is often remarked as interfering in Nepal's internal affairs. How do you look at it and how do you see China's engagement with political parties in Nepal in coming days? So do you like to answer this question? Yeah, but okay, uh, fine. Um, uh, China has been consistently from uh, 1950s till today, uh, from the uh, top political leaders, uh, consistently uh, conveyed the masses of the Nepalese politics that we don't want to involve in Nepalese internal matters. We don't intrude on internal matters. That is the beauty of the, our relationship with China, and then we always appreciate that kind of the attitude of China. As I mentioned in my deliberations also, the movement was held in Nepal 10 years, the Maoist movement, in the name of their uh, very um, respected leader, uh, Mao, but uh, they never supported. Um, um, we have uh, six times resigned from 1950s to till now, but uh, China always worked together with the, with the uh, government in, in Power, and then they respected Nepali people's choice and selections. And uh, there is no any overt and covert. Uh, they they, they uh, maintain a relationship with the, with the outlawed uh, um, uh, forces um, outlawed by the by the government. I mean that the uh, bar debarred from the from the government uh, and the uh, restricted by the law. Um, um, there are a lot of other examples, other, 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 uh, our neighbor and the, and the, in the other Western countries. Uh, there are a lot of examples that books are written and the several historical incidences are there. They always intrude on our internal matters and then engage in um, the outlawed outfit uh, uh, political forces even. They, they instigated the, the, um, uh, unlawful um, political or the or social forces and then destabilized Nepal and then created uh, instability, unrest in Nepal. But very recently, um, if you talk about that, uh, some of the one meetings that was very critically, uh, um, the Nepali people uh, diaspora sometimes become a little bit much more critical on the, on the visit of the Chinese Communist Party leader during that uh, intense uh, conflict, intra-party intra conflict in uh, ne Nepal Communist Party. That was the only incident uh, that we've seen a little bit, maybe our uh, China is much more engaging on political parties on internal matters. That was criticized. And then later on, they uh, consistently uh, conveyed the message. The, the, the very recently, there was a conversation between the, the Chinese foreign minister and our foreign minister, Chinese state councillor and foreign minister Wang Yi and our foreign minister, uh, Dr. Narayan Khanka. And earlier too, with the, with the um, foreign minister Gimali and foreign minister um, Wang Yi, consistently said that uh, China doesn't want to involve in Nepal's internal politics. And they, we, do, we do not interfere on in Nepal's politics. That's why we have to see from the continuum of history. Um, we have to see from the historical perspective and the last 70 years history, and we should not judge a big power from the one incident or one event or one activity uh, for their uh, uh, construed as, as an entire foreign policy regime. This is not their foreign policy regime. And then I'm confident that um, they will continuously work together with the uh, government in power and then they will respect the Nepal's uh, choices of the people. That is the beauty of the relationship with China. They have no any intention to expand their territory and intrude on internal matters. That is uh, consistently conveyed the message. 
Even if you talk about the Mao Zedong, or you talk about the Hu Jintao or the President Xi Jinping, or any high leaders, or the, even you talk about the bordering leaders, they always convey the message that we don't want to interrupt Nepal's internal matters. We don't intrude on, and then we are equal. When it was 1950, the Chinese uh, PLA came to uh, Lhasa, and the, the leader of the PLA visited Nepali consul general in Lhasa at that time, and they conveyed the message that the countries can be big or small, but sovereignty is equal. We respect Nepal as a sovereign equal friend. That was the message conveyed by Mao in 1950, and that policy is continued till today to the season. This is the beauty of relationship with China. Uh, and the, it's not with others. Others have been time and again intruding on internal matters and playing with and then fill the game even and the instigating and provocating the outlawed organizations. And the, even, uh, even instigated the violence also in Nepal, no? provoked and promoted. That is not in the interest of Nepal. Because China supports Nepal's uh, um, sovereign independence and the prosperity and stability. And that has some historical reasons as well as their own, con uh, own, own interest as well. Because a, their border, Tibet is their very sensitive border. And the, any instability in Nepal, any kinds of the instability in Nepal would definitely have the ramifications, would have implications on their, uh, on, their, on their very sensitive part, Tibet. That's why they want stability in Nepal. That will have the positive implications on, on, on Tibet, Tibet's stability. And that is the China's interest as well. And then we should uh, always uh, uh, appreciate China on that particular part, not into internal matters. Talk about the foreign aids. No? If that we receive the foreign aids and cooperations, there are a lot of ifs and buts and conditions and so and so and so and intruding on the internal policies and matters, giving pressure. If you want to money, do this. If you want to money, do that. You will not get money, something like that. If you don't get money, if you don't get my con consultant, my advisors. That is what the almost all the countries do, not China. China provides all grant assistance to the Ministry of Foreign uh, Finance through the government channel. They don't uh, uh, put any, any conditionalities that, uh, uh, that, uh, that can be um, considered as an intrusion on our internal policy matters internal politics. And sometimes that, uh, 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 quite often that happens with other countries. This is the beauty of relationship with China. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, sir. Uh, I'll get back to you again. We have a few more questions. Uh, I would like to request Sanjay, sir, for this, uh, to respond to this question. Do you think uh, a time will come when Nepal will have to choose between China and Indo-Pacific powers led by the US? If yes, how will Nepal have to deal with that difficult situation? May I request to Sanjay, sir, to respond to this question? Uh, yes, uh, thank you for the question. I don't think, you know, our, uh, based on our <clears throat> innate uh, geographical, geopolitical, a relationship that we'll have to choose between China and the Indo-Pacific nations. Uh, our basic uh, survival, our basic uh, national interest would lie in uh, maintaining uh, equal relations with our two immediate neighbors and uh, conducting, uh, you know, our foreign policy, our, our um, as independently as, as we can, and uh, being very honest, forthright in our deliberations with each neighbor. Now, the pressures that uh, would come to uh, bear upon Nepal having to choose sides will be, uh, it will be very disastrous for our own, ex I feel, from our own existence and our own uh, survival as an independent nation state. There will be challenges. I mean, it's not gonna be rosy all the way. One of those challenges we are even experiencing now, as other panelists have pointed out, but uh, we have to have that prudence and we have demonstrated that in the past. We can still uh, in episodes uh, in the past where uh, 
Nepali uh, wisdom, Nepali uh, maturity prevailed, and we did not have to uh, make a, a choice of that nature. But uh, I think a lot will depend on our own um, uh, ability to understand uh, where our interests lie, basically, where Nepal's national interests lie, and make decisions accordingly. And I do not think choosing sides in, 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 in any such way will have any beneficial impact to our national interest. Uh, sir, I want to add one more question that you received in Facebook. How do you look at the West confronting with China in South Asia? Well, the West con uh, confronting uh, China in South Asia I mean, in, in some uh, basic uh, level is very understandable. Also, you know, you, uh, you have one rising power who is not uh, uh, ethnocentrically the same uh, as the reigning uh, superpower. Uh, you have uh, diametrical uh, uh, political systems each represent. And countries are being forced to, you know, uh, choose sides based on either hyped up uh, uh, security threats or, you know, uh, played down aspects of other um, uh, other uh, dimensions of the relationship. So. Basically, we for, for for other countries of South Asia, maritime countries, you know, uh, countries far stronger in terms of resource-based military power prowess. You know, each each has you know de devised their own uh, way of dealing with this competition. But for us, uh, our historical experience, our historical, our geopolitical necessity, and uh, uh, things is that we just stay away from this rivalry. We are not, uh, uh, we make our own choices being, you know, what serves the Nepali national interest is what should guide the Nepal's, Nepal's policy instead of playing, uh, you know, big games, uh, you know, superpower games that we can ill afford and which we can only be the ultimate losers from. All right, thank you so much. Uh, we have uh, one more question. I would like to request Mr. Siva Prashad Tiwari, sir, uh, to respond to this question. Uh, there is a sharp increase in scholarship from China to South Asian students. Uh, how do you see China's engagement in South Asia in next three decades? Uh, I would like to request Tiwari, sir, to share your opinion. Uh, it would be a bit difficult for me uh, to uh, say exactly how would China's in engagement be for uh, coming three decades. Uh, with uh, regard to scholarship, um, I think it's very good uh, that China has been offering um, uh, you know, scholarships, uh, not only in medicine, engineering, uh, and other technical fields, uh, but uh, in subjects like uh, humanities or even social sciences. Uh, to many students in Nepal, and every uh, powerful country does uh, uh, that uh, for the sake of soft power, and these are very good moves because they in enhance people-to-people, -people, um, you know, interactions, and uh, these is scholarships create a kind of uh, you know uh, ambassadors uh, for uh, countries, goodwill ambassadors for countries. Uh, it would be a bit uh, because of uh, I think a lack of my in-depth study, it would be, uh, or because of constantly evolving uh, international politics, or, um, you know, when political relations take uh, very unforeseen turns, uh, it would be difficult for me to say how China-Nepal, Nepal relations would, Nepal-China relations would evolve during the course of next three decades. Uh, but uh, the way China has been very much powerful uh, not uh, only in uh, you know in relationship with Nepal, but in international uh, politics as well. Um, uh, I think China's influence is there to remain in Nepal for a long time to come. Uh, like in many other countries of the world, China has reached uh, you know uh, to countries of uh, South America, Africa, 
uh, and um, many other countries. China's influence is uh, in increasing even in universities of United States or Canada or New Zealand or France. Uh, you know, it has been um, uh, and it has been uh, creating uh, you know goodwill for China in many parts of, of the world. Um, in my opinion, uh, you know China is a great power. It is in the process of becoming a superpower, and China's influence will enhance in Nepal uh, and in in decades to come. Uh, China will be our in, important in, uh, development partner. And as Ambassador Odell said, we have to. Uh, you know, but dedicate ourselves to one China policy, both in words and actions. Uh, but uh, my, uh, my 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 opinion is that uh, you know we have fought for more than seven decades for our democracy. The, my only concern is that uh, you know anti-democratic forces in Nepal, which have uh, you know which feel that a democratic um, system, a, pol a political system. Uh, you know, are different from our present democratic system should be there somewhat modern and China should not be allowed to be emboldened uh, uh, because of our relationship with China. Both Chinese state and Chinese Communist Party have to be careful of this because, um, uh, because a political model, something similar to China uh, or a political party, something similar to uh, the Communist Party of China uh, is not going to happen there in Nepal because of our geopolitical imperatives. So, uh, like China, uh, you know, kept a relationship with Nepal very good during time of monarchy, as I uh, outlined earlier. Chinese Communist, um, you know, model, Chinese Communist Party, a Communist Party of China, and a party state of China were theoretically, you know, anachronistic, incongruent to Nepal's monarchy. Even then, they uh, you know, succeeded in maintaining very good relation with Nepal, sensitive with, uh, uh, which was sensitive to Nepal's sovereignty, respectful of Nepal's sovereignty. I think China should um, you know, give continuity to that approach in relation with um, Nepal at present. There are many forces inside Nepal that try to drag China, similar to you know, uh, India was dragged similarly by our political elites, our elites um, of other sectors, and most probably other Western powers were dragged. But uh, China should also be uh, China should be careful of this because uh, um, you know our political elites, our elites in other sectors, um, drag any political power uh, as long as uh, it, it fulfills their interests, um, their group's interests, or personal interests. Um, um, it's uh, it sounds a bit uh, you know um, it sound it might sound uh, a bit uh, um, you know um, um, uh, a bit uh, I'm not getting that word uh, 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 surprising let, let me say to ask one power which ha which has been allowed to come to here come here uh, making critical greater strategic inroads to exercise a limit. But I think that China has to exercise that wisdom again uh, in context of Nepal, uh, because uh, greater involvement with Nepal's communists uh, or you know projection of uh, or apparent um, greater proximity with Nepal's communists um, might uh, be uh, you know might not do good even for China's interest. That is my uh, opinion. Thank you. All right, all right. So thank you so much. We have one more question. Uh, to Ambassador Powder. Uh, to what extent does uh, there is a perception gap among Chinese and Nepalese leadership in understanding each other's country and their foreign policy? Um, uh, what I uh, feel uh, during my uh, meetings and interactions with uh, Chinese leaders uh, that uh, they are very clear um, and consistent on, on, on their policy towards Nepal and the understanding about Nepal. That's why, um, uh, as uh, the previous speaker also mentioned uh, during his presentation, that uh, uh, Chinese leaders always, from the Mao's period to till the Xi Jinping's period, say that uh, you maintain a good relation with your neighbor, India. And the, this, their advice suggested. That means uh, they know the practical ground of Nepal. 
they know how we are dependent on India. Um, and um, they supported, uh, there is one story when, uh, that it was maybe in the BB Koirala's period and they, when um, BB Koirala asked for uh, uh, support, economic cooperation, and the Zawan Lai said that, uh, although we can provide a little bit more than India, but we would not do. And then we will give you a little bit less than India that they said in the 1960s. And the, that's why Chinese perception and understanding Nepal, Nepal is a very uh, lovely country and uh, very cooperative to Nepal, China, China's and understands China's core interest, that is their understanding. And the Chinese people are very simple and a lot peace loving. They want to uh, improve their living condition. That is what they understand very well. And they need to support Nepal when there are the difficulties and then when they face difficulties in the areas. But, but uh, particularly understanding China about Nepal, we have a lot of gaps, not only in political leaders, but on common people as well. And the, about the uh, history, historical relationship with China, many people say that, oh, Himalaya is a big barrier. But they don't understand that until the 17th century, there were more, the largest number of foreigners that stay in Nepal were the Chinese people. And the Nepalese people going abroad, the largest number of ne people going abroad were in China. The destination, the Nepalese for the foreign country was China. And then in Nepal, the largest number of foreigners were in China. This course was uh, uh, changed in opposite direction after the um, 1816, uh, the Sugoli Treaty. We become a much more subservient to the, to the British than the, than the uh, independent, uh, uh, maintaining independent foreign policy and maintaining good relations with North. That's why there is a lot of perception. Many people even don't uh, know and believe that there can be a bus service. We started a bus service from Lhasa to Kathmandu in 20, 2005 when I was a consul general there. And then when that bus arrived in Kathmandu, many people say that, oh, is it possible? Is this a real or the game? Uh, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe uh, articulated and fake news. They said like, something like that. And the, the Kerung border was there for more than 2000 years. It is running, operating there. We can have the intensive collaborations and cooperation. Just uh, uh, um, Mr. Sanjay Upadhyay mentioned that uh, why Nepal needs to replace India. We don't want to replace India. There is no replacement. It is not the replacement. The excessive dependence on India that compromises on sovereign independence of Nepal. Excessive dependence on India makes Nepal much more vulnerable. That is a basic understanding. You can understand, I can understand, very simple people can understand. And that's why the King Mahindra opted the, um, the diversification policy. When that uh, we approached to the other countries than India, and India was not happy in, in, in 1960s. And, the, uh, and they said that, oh, why Nepal needs to go there? And we will fulfill all your requirements. This is not a sovereign uh, relationship between two sovereign countries. They should not, India should not ask that whatever Nepal needs, we provide. Don't go to China, don't go to, don't ask with others. No, 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 this is absolutely not. We should be very clear and transparent unless and until we don't invite China in, in Nepal against India's core security interest. And there is no question of asking Indians to avoid Chinese assistance and cooperation. And the third country has no right to speak about uh, the Chinese cooperation in Nepal. India has right because India is a neighbor. India has that right, not third country. Third country cannot come in Nepal and advise us, oh, don't take your support from China. Who are they? Why this? Was? India can say that, oh, this is my security interest. If they really say that this security interest, and we have to think about it. Of if, if it is not a security interest, and then why the India should object on the cooperation with China? If China don't object on our cooperation with India, why should India object on our cooperation with China? 
we should have the independent foreign policy, of course. And then we should have an equal, uh, uh, equidistance relationship. And then we should uh, enhance the cooperation with China so that Nepal can be a country, interdependent country from the most dependent country on one, one side. That's why we need to enhance our cooperation, not because replacement of India, but because of the, our, our aspirations to be an independent sovereign state and, the, uh, and the take our, our, our destiny on our own hand and, and maintain our relationship with our, um, uh, with our own interests and uh, maintain goodwill with all the country. The Western countries has a rivalry with China. They are the anim animosity. And then China is our good friend. Why should we look after from the foreigner's uh, point of view and then consider China as a, as a, as a foe? China is our friend. And the China and India are two neighbors, and there is no any replacement of this relationship with these two countries. There is no substitute. There is no choice. But this is by default. And the third, the, the relationship with the other countries beyond India and China is our choice. We should have the selection based on our national interest. And the third country, we have to maintain our relationship with all the countries in the world but on the selection basis. And that cannot jeopardize our relationship with China. That cannot jeopardize our relationship with India. That support we must accept from any other country. But if that jeopardizes, compromises, and hinders our relationship with our neighbors, and then we should have a courage to say, no, you have the rivalry, we don't have. If you have any issues with Beijing, talk with them, not with us. Don't drag on on, on your own, own basket and the, to deal with China. No, no, no. We absolutely should say that no. Uh, same to India. If someone drags, if someone wants to drag us uh, on the, on the, against uh, India, and then we should say no, 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 no. We, we will not do that. And then we, we cannot afford to do that, and we should not do that. That's very clear. This very much clear, and we must be transparent and don't deal on the uh, very secretly. And that will, the small countries cannot, uh, uh, cannot uh, manipulate the relationship by dealing secret. The strength is our uh, transparency, maintaining relationship. That is our strength. And then we should inform the people that why we should maintain this relationship with these countries, and then why we are making this relationship, what is our interest. Our interest is stability. Our inter interest is prosperity, but without any having a disturbances in our relationship, good relationship, smooth relationship with our two immediate neighbors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Powell, for your some constructive suggestions and analysis, the balanced analysis. Thank you so much once again. Uh, actually, we are running out of time, but still we have a few questions, but I would like to take one last question. Uh, and maybe the other speakers can respond in a minute or even less than that. So the question is, how is China expanding its soft power in Nepal in recent times? Uh, I would like to request any of the speakers open. Uh, please respond it within like two or three sentences because we are just running out of time. Uh, may I respond once? Yeah, sure. Uh, recently, I undertook uh, a study uh, about China's soft power in Nepal. Uh, so I think uh, it would not be uh, natural for me to attempt to try this. <clears throat> So, uh, you know, in respect of uh, soft, if you talk about the soft power's definition, uh, and uh, th there is one global evaluation of soft power of countries uh, produced by one organization called the Soft Power 30. It is affiliated to some university, I forgot it now, uh, in the United States of America. So it evaluates uh, soft powers of the countries based uh, ranks uh, based on empirical evidences. So uh, on that basis, uh, you know, China's soft power, uh, it uh, ranks 30 countries of the world and China makes to the bottom of the list, <clears throat> which China does not agree because soft power is uh, measured on the basis of, um, you know, uh, political culture, 
values uh, and education soft power um, sorry education uh, and uh, and movies and other cultural uh, things china also believes on measure of soft power based on culture but uh, this uh, culture according to china is not only a political culture that is taken as synonym as synonymous with uh, liberal democratic culture uh, as said by the west china takes pride in uh, culture that has it has been continuing in china for more than uh, for about 5000 years in, uh, one interesting fact to note here is uh, though you know these uh, um, studies by the western countries quote on quote these studies by western countries say that china hardly makes to the top 30 uh, list of the countries uh, in uh, soft power based uh, on empirical measures uh, with respect to nepal i think the china exercises uh, soft power very effectively um um very much effectively uh, may it be in in the sector of education may it be in the sector of uh, you know influence in um, influence in media may it be in the sector of influence uh, influencing political parties and may it be in the inf um, influence uh, you know a, a, a positive image that is built through um, you know developmental projects uh, and may it be through you know reconstruction that it uh, post earthquake reconstruction it helped and may it be through uh, you know materials uh, equipments that we required uh, after covid 19 pandemic in nepal china has a lot of soft power in 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 nepal uh, according thank to one you. Uh, okay. thank you sir but maybe due to time limit we will not be able to take it for long time if i would like to request if any of the speakers want to add add on on this okay, question like how is china expanding its soft power maybe in a minute or so and then we'll wrap it sanjay sir we cannot hear you uh no i don't think i'll have anything to add because i've been away from uh, nepal for a while but i think uh Uh, it is uh, growing and uh, i would understand why china would not uh, agree with the ranking of the listing that uh, the previous speaker mentioned yeah i would agree with that mm. yeah. uh yeah. i have a ambassador... lot lot that's why i, yeah. I uh, uh, stop here all right thank you so much once again to all our distinguished speakers for your valuable time for a special presentation and the fresh analysis and the way out uh, thank you so much once again on the behalf of nice and uh, it was a great honor for us to have all of you here and thank you so much to all the participants who joined us through different platforms like zoom facebook twitter and others thank you so much and Uh, we couldn't take all of the questions so we would like to sincerely apologize for that and maybe the organizers can uh, respond them separately later so it was uh, uh, a wonderful discussion on nepal china relations definitely there are uh, huge gaps in understanding each other but uh, we are hopeful that they will be able to find a way out and uh, to create a conducive environment where they can work together in a win win situation so let's hope for that thank you so much once again uh, for your precious time and for the sharing thank you thank you thank so you much. also